Yeah, transitional justice here on Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We have the the honor of talking to Stella Pizzato. She's a a a, a member of PEJ Project Expedite Justice, and she joins us today from Verona, Italy, uh, which is between Milan and Venice. Am I right, Stella? Yes, exactly. And thank you for having me here, Jay. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so what do you do for Project Expedite Justice, and how does it involve the title of our show, which is Indigenous People? Yes. So I've been with Project Expedite Justice for a year, a little bit more over a year. And um, I'm a consultant, uh, mainly I work in the Conservancy and Indigenous Peoples' Rights Project. Um, we've initiated like a, a research and investigative report about a year ago. Uh, I also sometimes work on other projects within Project Expedite Justice. We have projects working on Ethiopia, on Sudan, on South Sudan, uh, on Ukraine. So I sometimes I hop around the project when, when it's needed, but mainly I'm on the Conservancy and Indigenous Peoples' Rights Project. Okay, I want to make a distinction. I'd like to know the difference between, you know, we have, we have um, you know, interviewed a number of people for Project Expedite Justice, some, some of them in Europe, some of them in Africa, some of them in Latin America. And, um, you know, they're usually talking about atrocities, usually talking about murder in rural areas uh, or in mm -hmm. cities uh, where government has gone off the side and, and killed people and the, there are war crimes involved. Um, so, um, and I know you have a lot of projects, you meaning Project Expedite Justice, has a lot of projects, investigations, um, you know, uh, commissions, uh, maybe prosecutions, uh, lawsuits and all that about those war crimes and atrocities. What's the mm -hmm. difference between um, what those investigators are doing and what you're doing? Okay, so to start with uh, the Conservancy and Indigenous People Rights Project, it's a very new project. So compared to the other projects that uh, that we have, it's something that we built a, like in a year now, starting from from scratch. So from researching these these crimes, uh, which in our case in in Conservancy and Indigenous Peoples Rights uh, Project are not war crimes per se. Uh, maybe they sometimes can reach uh, the level of crimes against humanity, but uh, it's not like that is not what we're investigating now. Uh, we, um, we are looking at land dispossession. So when indigenous peoples are removed uh, forcibly from, from their lands, uh, we are looking at uh, all the consequence that this land dispossession has on indigenous peoples. And we are looking at also gross human rights violations that happen within the protected areas. So torture, arbitrary detention, rape, extrajudicial killings. Um, so we do come across uh, gross human rights violation also in these areas. That, that might be the similarity uh, with, with the other projects. And also these are marginalized communities. They're upon the most marginalized communities in the world, indigenous people. So Project Expedite Justice works with marginalized uh, people around the world that have a difficulty assessing justice. And also this is another similarity uh, with our project, with the new project. <laughs> oh, that's very important. So um, what is an indigenous person? Uh, can you give us a you know just a thumbnail definition of what 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 how is that different from an ordinary person? Okay, so there is no um, like uh, made definition for indigenous peoples that is accepted worldwide. Uh, what we do with uh, PJ is that we look, look at, we look at the UN kind of definition and. Um, it was given years ago uh, on a policy paper. And uh, basically indigenous peoples are people that live um, and are where came before uh, other people and they live in ancestral, uh, in their ancestral lands. Sounds to, and you mentioned also the dispossession of ancestral mm -hmm. lands is a critical piece in you know, defining um, the problems for indigenous people. Um, and I, you know, uh, it sounds like what we're 
talking about here is that people who are particularly vulnerable, they start yes. off being vulnerable. They start off without having a whole lot of prospects and, and options in life. Am I right about that? Yes, you're completely right. So indigenous peoples are already very vulnerable because uh, of the fact that they're so marginalized. And uh, most of the time they're not recognized by their governments. Um, it's, it's also a choice of life, uh, you know, like um, what, they, what they are. Uh, but uh, when, when they're dispossessed from their lands, uh, because their attachment to the land is so strong, and their forest is everything, it's their church. So they, they, be, they are so attached to, to their land that when they're dispossessed, they, they lose part of their identity and uh, um, yes, they lose part basically of their identity when, when they're dispossessed from, uh, uh, from their land, which is really sad. You know, I, I was thinking as you were describing that, Stella, of a movie that I saw maybe five years ago by Ai Weiwei, uh, who's a Chinese dissident uh, activist, uh, uh, human rights person. Um, and this movie was called Human Flow. And it talked about, um, you know, the number of people in this world of ours today who are in camps, forced involuntary camps. They're sort of stateless. They don't know where to go. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to take care of them. Uh, they've been the victims of one kind of atrocity or another, maybe sort of a, a, a group atrocity, if you will. And, and I guess what I'm thinking, and, and, and at the time, at the time, the movie um, told us that the number of people in these camps worldwide was something in the order of 65 million people behind barbed wire um, who had no prospect of education or uh, any, any, any wealth accumulation or even leaving the camps. And they went through generations upon generations in these camps. Um, and, and they died in these camps. There were cemeteries in these camps. It was, it was very tragic. Uh, and it was a mm -hmm. study of a phenomenon that you know, I didn't know about. And I'm wondering if uh, the dark side of this is if you are unable to help um, a, a, uh, an indigenous person, an indigenous group, uh, where do they wind up? Uh, and they've been dispossessed from their, you know, their traditional land. Um, nobody helps them. Are they, do they wind up in the camps as Ai Weiwei was talking about in his movie? Well, they do sometimes end up in refugee camps uh, when they're dispossessed. But um, what I heard the most uh, from Indigenous peoples and other organizations that work in the field, uh, Indigenous people will protest till the end, till they're killed. To, to stay in their land. And uh, this is something very uh, inspiring and, and powerful that they have uh, in, their, in their nature. Um, so yeah, they, they might end up forcibly in some other situations that they're, that they're not choosing, um, but uh, they will try, uh, they're trying. Uh, till the end. That's why there are so many scandals, uh, for instance, with the Masai in, in, in Tanzania uh, of people that are getting killed because they're trying to go back to their to their to their ancestral lands. So um, they're fighting. They're, they're fighting all over the world. Oh, they're fighting to get back to where they were removed from. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, the Masai yeah. is famous for that. It's really very tragic uh, in, in Tanzania. So um, what, what can you do um, as a member of BEJ, uh, making these investigations, writing these reports? What can you do, in fact, to help them? Okay. So what, what we do and what we're trying to do in uh, the best case scenario, obviously, um, is to, well, first, we understood the situation. Uh, we mapped out uh, what is happening, why it's happening. Uh, how it happens uh, in, in different areas. And now on the next phase, in the next phase of the project, we are trying to dive in in one country that uh, we are in the process of choosing. Uh, and then 
there uh, we also are in the process of making um, connections with the people on the ground that know their way around uh, the park and also know how to talk uh, to, to indigenous peoples um, or local communities. And from, from there, then we would uh, try to map uh, the evidence that we can gather uh, we usually go for fresh evidence, um, so um, atrocity that have happened within a year, within a year or two. Uh, and then, uh, depending on what we can get, uh, we will uh, either make, uh, um, so we, we, we will either pursue sanctions uh, or um, help in domestic cases um, or other human rights bodies. But most importantly, we, we first need to listen to what the communities want. Uh, because if we go there and we say, uh, we want to take your case to court, and maybe that's not what they want, uh, but maybe they want to learn how to do it themselves, then PJ will teach them, will help them build the capacity uh, to do that. So we, we will start from what the community um, wants. Um, PJ has a community-based approach in all of its projects, and we we will copy paste it to to conservancy and indigenous peoples' rights project. But part of that is to uh, uh, is to build trust with the people that you seek the information from, uh, and yes. they could be from a completely different culture. They are not from Verona usually, right? <laughs> <laughs> they're they're from, uh, undeveloped countries, uh, undeveloped areas in, in Africa, Latin America, maybe. Uh, so my question to you is, how do you build that trust? How do you approach them? Especially when mm -hmm. you maybe you can't get to them physically and you mm -hmm. have to deal with them through the internet or email or message, text message, who knows what. How do you build trust with somebody who's far away in a, in a different world? So connecting with them was actually one of the main challenges we faced uh, at the beginning of the project, but I mean, also now uh, in terms of infrastructures and also internet connection for them, it's, it's really hard to connect to something if they, if they live in the forest, obviously. So uh, we had uh, issues like connecting with them and we try to use maybe different kinds of communication, maybe just a text. Going back to your questions, um, time. Uh, you need time to build trust. Um, you need to show that you're there for them. So you need to show that you're available. Um, and also uh, it's important from the start not to, to build uh, expectations too high. Um, because uh, they're suffering a lot, they're traumatized, they've lost everything, they've lost their lands. Um, so we we say also that um, this is where we can go if we have this, this and that. So yeah, being truthful to them and um, transparent uh, helps <laughs> building trust. Uh, and also showing that we are there for them and we and that we care. Do you, you talk to them on the phone or use a Zoom meetings like this one um, to yeah, actually have a face-to-face -face discussion or at least a, a voice discussion? Yes, uh, we did. And uh, I, mean, I mean, at least for me, it was um, uh, very... Um, yeah, it was it was particular. <laughs> it was very special um, to to talk with them. Uh, also very intense uh, because uh, also they maybe their way of talking and of speaking, um, expressing their thoughts. Um, it's it's different um, in, in my perspective uh, from from maybe what how I would say something or how you would say something. Um, and uh, what what comes out of these conversations, it's really their attachment to the land and that they want to be recognized more. They want to be part of the decision-making process when it concerns their land. And uh, they want their knowledge as indigenous people to be used and recognized because 
they know, they've experienced that that's the best way of doing conservation. So that's something that they, they really stress when, uh, when we talk to them, that they, they want to be, uh, and, and they have to be uh, the, the main character in, in, in display. Um, yes. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, gee, there's so many questions that come to mind about this. <clears throat> when we spoke earlier, you mentioned that you, generally speaking, you talk English with them, um, but not everybody does speak English in some of these places. Uh, mm -hmm. What happens when you have a language or um, even if you have, you know, the, the person on the other end is able to speak a kind of rudimentary English, but you have a problem, you know, in, in really articulating what you want to say. And likewise, they have a problem in articulating what they want to say. And, and maybe they don't speak English as well as uh, some local indigenous dialect uh, or, or, I don't know, Swahili. Is that, is that appropriate in the Maasai area in Tanzania? I don't know. But, you know, a language, an African language, for example, that is not English, what do you do? So we have, um, or usually they have translators, uh, and uh, we talk through translators uh, with them. Um, for instance, uh, in, in Nepal, um, we uh, talked with an organization of indigenous women um and the chair of the organization is an indigenous woman um and um to talk with her she uh, invited an interpreter uh that was also part of the organization but that's usually how we, we try to solve these issues um i also most of um, the people we talk to uh, in africa they speak french for instance in cameroon or in drc and um, we have colleagues that speak French. Uh, so in, in that case, it's easier because we can um, solve the problem internally. You're operating now, your investigations, your discussions with people are in what, Africa, to some extent in Latin America. And are, are you also in places in Asia? Um, yeah, so for the exploratory report, we covered uh, a wide area, a wide geographical um, area. It was mainly Africa, so Uganda, I'm just naming a few, uh, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, the DRC, um, Cameroon, um, and then in, in South Asia, um, India and, and Nepal. Oh, and you mentioned we're Nepal, kind of, yeah. Yeah, in Nepal. Uh, so we are now diving into, let's say, one of these uh, or more than one of these countries and others that we are discovering through talks uh, with researchers, anthropologists, um, experts in the field. And uh, every day there is something new, something that we say, oh, we should research that as well. <laughs> And uh, there is a lot, but we haven't um, we haven't covered Latin America yet. Talking to people about very personal things, about their feeling about their land and the, the frustration that goes with being really thrown off their ancestral land. I'm mm -hmm. sure that's for a variety of reasons, all of them unfair, um, and and trying to help them um, develop some hope uh, and a future and a life for their families and all that. Um, why are you doing this, Stella? This is pretty demanding, and I'm sure it's emotionally demanding. Why are you doing this? It is emotionally demanding. So to, to answer, I, I see two sides of the same coin, and the coin being PJ for, let's say now, uh, on, on the one side, it's very fulfilling. Um, you feel that you are doing something and you are helping these very marginalized communities, these victims of uh, atrocities, of rape, of torture. Um, and on the other side, you also feel that you're never doing enough. Um, and there is maybe a sense of frustration sometimes because, um, yeah, these things keep happening. Uh, it's very hard to stop the, the cruelty of the human being. So you were really faced every day with um, 
with catastrophes, with human catastrophes. And um, well, what I hope is not to, to become detached <laughs> while working uh, on this in, in the long run, but always having like a sensitivity towards it. Uh, but definitely like in, in, in this job, you have to, to learn to, to also live your, your own life because it's different. I'm, I'm from Verona. Uh, I went to university. I'm here talking with you now. I, I will travel. Um, and, and these people have lost everything. Uh, so sometimes you also make a comparison and um, you can say, do, do I really deserve this? And, um, but then you talk with other people and it's, it's easier. Like it, it's nice to talk about this with colleagues and, and people because they, so some understand very well uh, and they are also grateful to you for doing this. What did you study in the university in Verona or anywhere else? And uh, you told me that you're taking a master's right now, is it? Or have you finished that already? And what, what areas of, of study have you been engaged in to qualify you um, for this very difficult work? I, um, I finished high school in Italy. And right after that, I, I moved uh, to other countries in Europe. I did my bachelor's in international European law in Groningen. <laughs> Very hard name to pronounce. It's a small uh, student city in the north of Holland, of the Netherlands. Uh, so I did my bachelor's there in international European law. And uh, I spent uh, six months in Southeast Asia. Uh, in uh, Well, initially I had to be in Hong Kong, but because of the protests of 2019, uh, after a month of university, I had to, to leave Hong Kong because of the political situation. And then I, well, I moved back to Groningen after traveling South Asia. And um, I just finished my master, um, actually today. <laughs> oh, congratulations. Yeah. Stella, that's Thanks. wonderful. We all congratulate you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it was a very hard uh, journey. It was a very tough journey, especially with uh, with the pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, I did my master's in uh, international transnational criminal law in uh, in Amsterdam. Wow, that's pretty ambitious. Uh, do you have a lot of friends and and classmates and colleagues who feel the same way about this uh, that you do? Um, I mean, are you part of a new generation in Italy or in Europe uh, or really anywhere in the world, um, which is dedicated to helping people, indigenous people and others who've been the victims of human rights violations? Uh, I think there have always been people uh, like us in the past that uh, wanted to do something for uh, for justice and for humanity. Otherwise, we wouldn't have uh, some institutions like the International Criminal Court um, and um, other human rights bodies. But I, I think maybe now it's becoming um, stronger, the sense uh, that we have to do something for climate change, for different wars around the world. And uh, people are taking studies about it. Maybe a few years ago, my master didn't exist and now it exists. So that's a change and that uh, says something uh, because we have the possibility to choose to study these and it's really niche, uh, but uh, there are people that do it. Yeah. So you must look down the road, Stella, and see what, you know, a career, a life uh, expressing these interests would be like. Um, how, how do you see your life unfolding? Will you, will you make this your life's work? Um, will you continue to travel and uh, talk to people in developing countries and um, be as fervent and passionate? Or do you think you might move on to something else? I mean, you you mentioned something before that was interesting that, you know, you, you didn't want to lose the passion here. Um, but there, you know, isn't there a progression in work like you're doing where you get to be management, <clears throat> you get to be an administrator. And as such, you don't necessarily deal directly with the people as, mm -hmm. as much as you used to. Um, what mm -hmm. about that? What is the career pattern? And, um, and is there a, a time 
uh, when you w will be an administrator, uh, a manager, and not have so much contact with the people that you talk to in these investigations? So what I really like about PEJ is that it's a very small organization and all, also the people at the top, for instance, Cynthia, or, um, yeah. Like You're referring Boyan. to Cynthia, <laughs> Cynthia Tai, the founder of uh, PEJ, yes. who, who lives in um, Kona, <clears throat> although she travels a lot. Now. Yeah, she does travel a lot. Uh, they're constantly in contact with these people, maybe even more than me sometimes. Uh, so that's what I really like about this organization because it's small and it gives everyone uh, the possibility to uh, to directly feel what's happening on the ground. Um, in terms of career path, like for now, uh, I just started, I just graduated and I think this is the place where uh, I have be now uh, to also learn and decide what to do in the future um, and if it will happen for me to um, uh, the possibility of uh, growing uh, I, why not like I I will definitely um, yeah take it as a possibility you know um, I know that you have colleagues in various countries various cultures yes various nationalities. Uh, it's interesting how uh, PEJ has, has a sort of a global network of people who are like you and motivated in, in the same way. Um, I mean, I, just my limited knowledge of it, I know they're in Latin America, I know they're in many places in Africa and Asia. Um, and and they, they're in Europe because a, a lot of the action, so to speak, is in Europe. Uh, the the cases the lawsuits the the court process what have you uh, and of mm -hmm. course uh, in, in Ukraine as well uh, and that and that's all totally appropriate but have you met them you talk to them uh, have you have you physically um, said hello to them uh, do you get around and meet your colleagues so I was actually very lucky and I had the chance to meet uh, Cynthia, Nicholas Sisman, uh, Boye, Arwa and other team, team members because we had a conference in, uh, in The Hague. Uh, we participated at PJ um, at the World Justice uh, Project, which is a conference that lasted for three, four days. Um, and uh, while Cynthia was traveling a lot, she made a stop in The Hague. Um, Nicholas was on a, on a mission and they stopped in The Hague. I was in Amsterdam. Um, other, uh, um, team, uh, other PJ uh, team members were also in Amsterdam for studying. So we did have a few meetings, but they're really, really rare. Um, but I'm I'm happy I had the chance to meet them personally after you know a year of seeing them in the screen. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'd like to um, you know ask you if you could sort of address um, American young people uh, who might be interested in this thing, or or if not if not interested because they don't know about it, interested in general in helping people. Um, you know, deal with violations of human rights of one kind or another at various places in the world. Uh, you know, in, in a way, Ukraine has woken a lot of people up about, you know, the need to protect the liberal world order, the need to help people who are under attack, disadvantaged, and so. Um, but what would you say to an American college graduate? What would you say to a master's candidate or a PhD candidate? Uh, in, in social sciences, um, to encourage that person to join organizations like PEJ and to travel and reach out and, and help people in, in various difficult places um, to cope with a, with a world that has uh, all too much violations of human rights. So it's a very difficult question because I also I think everyone reacts uh, in a different way to maybe what I think, uh, but um, what, like for me, what what woke me up is that uh, is understanding that this is my history. I'm I'm living this uh, time frame in, in in I'm living in this time frame in the world, 
and um, there is so much cruelty. There has always been a lot of uh, cruelty in the world. And uh, if you can do something to either be more aware of what's happening around you or um, yeah, something to kind of mitigate uh, this, the, the cruelty of, of, of some human beings, like you should do it. Um, so that, that's what I would say. Okay, one other thing is I, um, we're running out of time and I do want to ask you about this. So we have, we have um, heat waves, we have uh, supply chain issues, we have economic issues in various places, including Europe, certainly including Italy. Um, and uh, we, have, um, we have difficulties in getting around, in, in, in flying around. There are, there's been a lot of articles about how um, big American airlines and global airlines have canceled a lot of flights and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. At the same time, we hear about you know, heat, heat waves uh, in Europe and in the US. Uh, we hear about uh, fires uh, and other extreme weather in Europe and the US. And, and I wonder, I think it's appropriate for me to ask you how this affects your work, because it's going to affect people in Tanzania. Uh, it's going it's, to affect uh, all of these, um, you know, areas where indigenous people have lost their ancestral homelands. Uh, it's going to affect you getting around to them and them getting around to you. Um, it's going to affect a lot of things. And I wonder how you see that going mm -hmm. forward. Because climate change is not going to slow down until the world figures out how to deal with it. And the world hasn't figured that out yet. So query, how does climate change play in everything we've been discussing. Um, I was talking with an activist from uh, Chad um, and, um, and she said that there is this lake uh, in Chad where um, basically there is no more water. And when she was a kid, it was full of water. And these now, like the scarcity of resources due to, to climate change leads to conflicts within communities that maybe didn't fight like a couple of years ago to get some water from, from a nearby lake. So I think it will affect our job because there will be more and more conflicts uh, for this, for, for um, to, have re to get resources uh, because we have less and less water, um, or like drinkable water at least. <laughs> uh, and uh, if there are fires, then we lose wildlife, uh, we lose trees, uh, we lose forest. Um, so there, I think the worst uh, impact, uh, like among many others, uh, of climate change on, 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 my, on our job, um, is is really that it's going to increase the number of conflicts. Yeah, that's um, sad when you think about it, but at the same time, I'm I'm glad you're there doing what you do, and um, I want to express on my behalf and the people that I know who are sensitive to this, uh, thank you for your service to humanity. Thank you for for saying this, <laughs> for for seeing it, and also for uh, giving the space uh, to us to talk here. Stella Pisato, um, <laughs> the kind of person we want have, we want to have everywhere, not just in Verona. Thank you so much, Stella. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.